guys. Today's guest is a legend in his craft. He has been around since the 80s and is still going on strong. Now, I had the pleasure of working and meeting him, not work, working with him. Yep, that's what I meant. Um, when I was That's fine. Six. We were working. We worked and met each other. Yeah. That, that works for me. Um, when I was six, uh, he was... Yeah, he was world champion 12 years in a row and was the first in his sport to do the 900. Without further ado, <laughs> I give you Tony Hawk. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Good to see you again. Good it's been to a see while. you too. Yeah, this time I'm actually taller than your, uh, your knee, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, yes. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay, so what's been going on in the skateboarding world recently? Oh, wow. Well, uh, skateboarding is growing internationally, for sure, uh, in places like Asia, uh, South America, all over Europe. It's going to be in the Olympics next year, so there's a lot of push for, um, for international support. And random countries that have little skate scenes are suddenly finding themselves uh, with support from the governments to actually help them get training and to yeah. get skate parks. So that's exciting. I don't think that's, for me, the Olympics is not like the, the biggest thing ever because I feel like we've come a long way. Skateboarding is, is very popular uh, among youth, especially it's a lot more popular than many Olympic sports already. So I don't yeah. feel like we need that validation. If anything, they need our cool factor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, uh, there are a lot of different skate projects, uh, charities happening, like my foundation does public skate parks, Skatistan does skate parks and school projects in Afghanistan and Cambodia and South Africa, and so um, I feel like skateboarding is in a really good place, and people keep getting better at it, that's for sure. Well, that's obviously a good thing. People are getting better at it. Yeah, but I, I never imagined that it would come so far. The kind of tricks that we're seeing people do now on a regular basis are the kind of tricks that were reserved only for video games, say 15 years ago. <laughs> okay. Where you, the only way play you could actually do these things was in a video game because we're like, that's impossible. You can't do this trick to that trick to that trick. And now that's what's happening for real. <laughs> okay. So let's go back in time for a minute. <clears throat> You're basically just a kid with a skateboard. What, what, what was happening? I was skating with friends in my neighborhood. Skating was sort of the, the trend at the time. In fact, it was more on the way out. I didn't realize that. But um, So I picked up a skateboard. Actually, my first skateboard was my brother's hand-me-down because he was a surfer and he skated a little bit. And then I would just skate around my neighborhood with my friends on the sidewalks. Sometimes someone would build a little wooden, terrible quarter pipe ramp and <laughs> We'd skate that until the neighbors got angry with it, and then we'd tear it down. And um, okay. eventually, uh, I got invited by another friend to go to the local skate park, which was a little ways away. And so I went there, and when I went to that skate park and I literally saw people flying out of swimming pools is when I decided I wanted to do that for as long as I could. Okay. I wanted to do everything I could to get to the point where I could fly like the people I saw at the skate park. Right, right. So then, like, what basically, from there, what did you do to get where you are now? Uh, from there, I, I took every opportunity I could to get to the park, uh, begging for rides from my brother, um, pestering my parents to take me there when they weren't working, and um, quit the other sports I was involved with, <laughs> quit baseball, quit basketball, and I uh, basically just focused all my energy on skating, um, Went through a couple of pretty bad injuries that, that definitely frightened my parents. I mean, my earliest one. My first injury was uh, I knocked on my front teeth. I got a concussion. And um, not long after that, got another concussion. And uh, went through a little bit, but, but through it was still developing my, my craft and, and learning tricks. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like those made me... Uh, those setbacks made me more excited to, to learn what I did wrong, right. like to, to learn from those process. And I feel like a lot of people, especially in a sport like skateboarding, they get into it, they like it. And the first time they get hurt, they're like, I'm not doing that anymore because that is it's too scary or I don't want to push through these injuries. And my first instinct when I got hurt was, oh, I'm going to learn that trick and figure out how not to fall on okay. it. Okay. 
And so that, I think that was sort of a defining moment for me that uh, this is what I really want to do, even though it's against probably the better judgment of my health. Um, and then I would say within a year, I learned how to fly out of the pool. So your first major injury, <clears throat> did it like change the outlook that you had on the sport? It, it didn't. That's what I'm saying is I did, it didn't change my outlook. It definitely gave me a sense of reality that this stuff can be dangerous right. and that I have to be more methodical and calculated the way I do it and get better equipment because the helmet I was wearing was terrible. <laughs> my dad made me throw it away the next day um, because it was just like, it was a cool looking helmet, but it didn't work right, well. Right, Obviously right. it didn't work well. Uh, but it didn't change my outlook. It just, like I said, it, it made me realize that I love doing this and I'll do it even if I have to get hurt. Right. So when you started, you were really young. Was it difficult to, like, get through to other people from a skateboard, or was it just lots of fun? It, I was pretty young, so if, it didn't matter to me what people thought of it. Right. Because I had, a, I had a peer group. I had a community up at the skate park of friends that liked doing it, even though they didn't go to my school and some were older. I found my, my crew. And so a lot of my friends quit skating not long after that because it wasn't the cool thing to do anymore. And I just didn't care because I've, I've already was established in it. I think the, what you're asking though, like, was it hard to get noticed? Skating was very small at that point. There were only a handful of skate parks in all of the US. So the community was so small that if you did anything unique, if you had any success, you got noticed by, by the company owners, by, well, there was one magazine, but maybe by the magazine. So uh, it, was, it wasn't that hard to, to get recognition. It just, the recognition didn't really amount to much in terms of a career. Right, okay. Like if you get your picture in the magazine, no one's paying you. <laughs> <laughs> and right. and no, one, no one's offering you a contract. No one's putting a na your name on a skateboard. It was like, cool, I'm in a magazine. I have to go to school tomorrow. Okay, that's, that's an interesting way of putting it. Um, so let's just talk about the first time that you nailed the 900. What, A, what was going through your head when you went to do it? And B, how did, how did you feel after you actually accomplished it? Um, well, there's a, there's a long history with 900s because it's something that I had been trying for almost 10 years prior to making the first one at the X Games then. And so uh, I learned 720s in um, 1985 when I was, uh, what was I? I was 16, 17. And so I learned 720s on this little ramp in uh, Sweden, like with three people watching. And for me, that was the progression of spinning. So I had done 540s, I learned a 720, and then from in that moment, I thought, oh, a 900 is next. <clears throat> I was way too scared to try it because I just learned 720s and figured that one out. And so it wasn't until about four years later that I really started trying 900s physically and realizing how much more frightening and how much more effort it would take. So I tried it off and on through the years. So the first one I ever tried was in 1989. I tried it off and on through the years, got a little bit closer, and then sometime in the mid-90s, I started getting really close. I started actually figuring out how to spin and, and almost seeing my landing. And I made it my mission to, to do it. And, and so through the years of, I'd say, 1995 to 1998, I was trying it actively and got really close. In fact, I made one and ended up crashing right on the bottom and breaking my rib. Ow. And that made me stop trying it for a while, <laughs> obviously. Uh, so I had kind of given up on it by then. I'd say in like 1998, I was, I was almost done with it. I just, you know, I, I, I gave it my all. I almost tried, I almost got there. And the one I thought I was gonna make, I ended up getting hurt. So. Fast forward to the 1999 X Games, they were doing a best trick event, and there had been a few best trick events through the years, and I usually would go in it with the, with the approach that I'm gonna do a trick that I already know I can make, or that I've made at least once before. 
not a 900, but something difficult, my best trick. And so I went to the X Games with that approach, and I made the trick I had in mind right away. And then I thought, oh, I'm going to try this other harder trick. And if you wanted, like, what it is, it was a Varial 720, which is a 720 spin with an extra spin of the board. And then I made that trick. And so that's all I had. That's, that was literally my best trick. And so the announcer at the time said, oh, let's see a 900, kind of as a joke, but not really a joke, because he knew I'd been trying it. Right. And in my head, I thought, okay, I'll try 900 for the crowd just so they can see what it looks like. That really was my attitude. Like, I'll try it so they can see what it looks like, but I, I'm not going to make it because I've never made it. Um, and then I started trying them, and all of a sudden I had this consistent speed and this consistent spin. The ramp was, was one of the best ramps we'd ever ridden up to that point. And all of a sudden I realized that I had, I had this moment that, that this might actually work. And so I started trying to put it down and commit to it, and I fell forward, but I didn't break my rib. And then I thought, well, what if I shift my weight while I'm spinning so I don't fall forward again? And then I fell backwards, and that was the moment for me where it was like, I've actually figured out how to change my weight ratio. Oh, okay. And if I can, if I can even that out, it's going to work. And I'd say within two tries after making that realization, it worked. Um, and at that point, I was either going to make it or get taken away in an ambulance. Like, those are the only two options. <laughs> <laughs> above that One night. is obviously a better way of going One's about it. Output, but, but I wasn't going to quit. So that's, I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, my pride was not going to allow me to just walk off the ramp and be like, ah, oh, I didn't make it. So I made it. And if you want to know the truth, the feeling was just a big relief. I mean, I didn't feel like a celebration. It was just like, oh, I finally got that thing done. Okay. It's, it's like finishing a test. That's, that's an interesting way of putting it for sure. Because I've been trying it for so long and it had taken so much out of me. And, and, I, and I, like I said, I got hurt along the way that it was like, oh, I finally finished those finals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you could pick one highlight from your career... Out of everything you've done, what would it be? Uh, being on The Simpsons. Oh, I actually, I've seen that episode. Yeah, I remember that. I, I mean, it was such a, The Simpsons is such a, is such a barometer of pop culture. And to be featured in it at all is a great honor. Yeah. To be featured as you and as your own voice was like the greatest honor I could receive at the time in terms of, in terms of validation as someone who people know of in pop culture. Right. Um, and so it was a blast. Like I still, I'm hugely proud of being on it. I love that episode still. I still quote, like people quote it to me. I quote it to them. Um, it is by far the biggest reason besides video games that I'm recognized in South America is because of my Simpsons episode. <laughs> That's... Um, it's funny. It's and it was just it was just a blast. And, and it was sort of after I had stopped competing, when I had started doing big tours, and suddenly it was like, wow, I can't believe that I get to be on my favorite show. <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of interesting that the, uh, a TV show becomes a milestone to some people. It's, it's, still, it's, just, it's still going strong. Yeah, That's it's, it's amazing. It, it's crazy. I yeah. mean, they're on season, what, 20-something? <laughs> I don't think it's quite that many, but... It might as well be. Um, yeah, no, I, I'd love it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm hugely proud of obviously, like doing the 900 and and having that be my exit to competition, um, and it was a big moment for me. Um, but but I've had so many, for me, just as gratifying moments learning tricks that were not televised, that were just with friends, that I can't say like, well, that was the biggest thing because. There have been, even since then, I've done tricks that I'm hugely proud of and feel the great sense of relief and accomplishment, but no one's going to understand what a 360 shove at the front of the nose grind is or care. That's just not, <laughs> it's not a sports center highlight. Right. <laughs> Does your whole family skate? Uh, all of my kids skate, yeah. Yeah, and my wife, so yes, all my family. Sweet. My wife grew up skating um, in Detroit. She was sort of a um, badass punk rocker in the 80s. <laughs> 
And so we have many things in common. <laughs> well, that's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's cool that you both skate and... I think it's, it's yeah. not just skating, it's, it's, it's that sense of, it, it's sort of that value system and, and that approach to life that is you don't have to follow the exact route or path of mainstream sports or schooling or job, you know what I mean? And, and I feel like skating is, is, much, is very much that ethos where it's like, do it yourself, figure it out, make it up as you go. Right. That's... And so that's our approach to parenting too, is, is we want our kids to find their own voice and find their own way and not have to go through some, uh, some cookie cutter process of this is what you do in school, this is how you go to college, and this is your degree, and then you're in a job. And so I feel like we've, we've definitely put that, um, that philosophy into them by example. Well, it's, it's kind of cool how that can cross over you know, in a way. Sure, it, can, it opens up all kinds of doors because if you, if you believe in what you're doing and if you really are following your passion, then you're going to enjoy doing it and you're going to have a leg up on people who have only stuck to the sort of textbook way of doing things. Now, obviously you've helped your kids learn to skate. What is your favorite trick to teach others? Huh. <laughs> I think uh, that's a hard question. My favorite trick, it's, it's really a matter of what they want. What do they want to learn? Okay. So um, I, I, my favorite thing is to get them over the, the fear or the, or the block that they put up for themselves. And, and sometimes that is just riding a skateboard. Sometimes that is doing an ollie. Sometimes it's dropping in. Sometimes it's a kickflip. Sometimes it's something bigger. Um, but, but, the idea that I've helped them overcome or to believe in themselves enough to do it, that's the biggest accomplishment for me. I mean, the best example of that is, is I just taught my daughter how to drop in a few weeks ago and that clip went viral, much to our surprise. But to see her, she's frightened of a lot of things and some irrational fears too. And to see her overcome something that she really didn't think she was capable of was a huge step and, and really it has changed a lot of her perspective on life in terms of what she's scared of and how she approaches things. Cause she believes in herself now. That's, that's great actually. Like, that's, it's pretty it's really, cool. Yeah. Have you ever taught anybody how to do uh, something like a 900 though? Um, <clears throat> yes and no. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> um, I have definitely helped with people with techniques on a, trying it or learning it. Um, 720s, I've definitely taught people how to do 720s. Uh, but y y yeah, it's, it's a hard question because it's, it's kind of like once you get to that level where you're trying 900s, you're not looking for someone to coach you. <laughs> <clears throat> but at the same time, I can give little hints of, of a tweak that's going to help and maybe that will, will push you over the edge. But it's not like my, my direction is what made you do a 900. Do you know what I mean? Right. Like you've gotten to a place where you're actually spinning that thing. You're far more accomplished than needing my help. <laughs> okay. Because <clears throat> really, only, as, of to, as of today, there's only been about 10 people that have done the trick in the world. Huh, I didn't realize it was so small. Yeah. Um, it's still super hard. <laughs> well, I mean, the difficulty level doesn't really change over time. It, it does and it doesn't. If, if I were to tell you, say, 20 years ago, how many people, or 25 years ago, how many people could do kickflips, it wouldn't have been that many. And nowadays, you can pull up to a skateboard and say, do a kickflip, and 10 kids will do it right in front of you. That's... <clears throat> so, it, you know, the, the progression, it's not that the difficulty factor changes, it's the... It's the, the collective view of what you're doing changes because so many people have accomplished it that it seems like it's easier to get to. Oh, okay. Uh, I know we're been, getting deep here, but that, yeah. that is kind of how it goes. Um, you've been all over the world to skateboard. <clears throat> have you, like, is there a place that really stands out? Uh, I have been able to skate in the most unlikely places. I'd say the ones that stand out the most are Cambodia, uh, Sierra Leone, 
um, China, but, you know, places that just seems unlikely that there'd be any skating. And, and in some of the places, there wasn't any skating before I got there, including like West Africa. And when I showed up with my skateboard, all the kids were calling it roller boogie because they thought it was, a, it was like roller skates. <laughs> and I actually got to take them for rides for their first time ever seeing a skateboard, like uh, on my board with me and um, seeing how much enjoyment they got from that small entertainment was amazing. Now, okay, so you have been in, so, oh, uh, you've been in more movies and TV shows than some actors. Have you ever considered it as a, <laughs> as a full-time job? Not, not that I'm trying to, to say that there's people that aren't in stuff, but. Um, I never thought of it as, I never, how can I explain it? I never got into skateboarding as a springboard to some other career. So it wasn't like, well, I got into skateboarding so that I could get some recognition and then I'm going to be a rapper or I'm going to be a movie star. <laughs> okay. Those things are super fun for me, but, but I know that's not my expertise and I know that I wouldn't be the greatest actor and I don't want to study it to become because it's just not what interested me. I love that I have this, this success and this tool, not tool, but vehicle to get into other stuff like that when, when it's appropriate, like when we did our movie. Right. I played myself. It wasn't yeah. a stretch. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, obviously, there had to be a little bit of acting in it uh, because, because of our scene, mostly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but that's super fun for me. And so I love doing those things if the opportunity is appropriate. But I'm not, you know, reading for the next Iron Man or anything like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um. There was a bit of a, a, a lull, I guess you could call it, in the 90s for skateboarding. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, eh. skateboarding kind of lost its popularity in that that time. So what was that like for you? It was really hard. I, uh, I had just started a family. I had one son on the way. Well, you know, was born around the same time. And... I had two mortgages, I had a lot of responsibility, and I had an income that was dropping by half every month because everything that we were doing was based on uh, royalties and skateboard sales and, and shoes, and suddenly like no one's buying skateboards or skate shoes, and I wasn't making any money. So it got really hard. I, I started doing other jobs. I, started, I had some video editing gear, and so I started editing videos for people for money. Um, I started doing the most random skate exhibition appearances for very, very small money. Um, but it paid the bills and it allowed me to keep skating. So, and, and other things, I mean, I had to, I had to cut back on a lot of expenses. I had to, I was eating Tom Ramen and Taco Bell and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches almost all day. Now, I mean, for, for a couple of years. Okay. Um, and I had to sell my house and move into a smaller place. I mean, all those things seemed like a struggle, but it was what all the things I had to do to be able to keep skating as a career. Um, so I don't look back on it as some, <clears throat> as some great hardship because I did what I had to do so that I could still chase my dream. Now, with that, uh, uh, like, buying skateboards and whatnot, there, you once made a skateboard that had the Titanic sinking on it. Was yeah. there a... Is there a story behind that? Or? There is, yeah. I'm impressed that you know that. Um, so when I first started Birdhouse, my skate company, I started it in 1992 at skating's ultimate lull in popularity because I thought that that was my way of transitioning out from being a pro skater to being a business owner. And so I started a skate business in, in hoping that skateboarding was going, going to come back in popularity and in sales. And so... When I chose to make my first pro model of my, with my name on Birdhouse, I thought it was appropriate that it was the t t Titanic sinking because it was like I, we had this huge, unstoppable momentum of being pro skaters, and it was all sinking. Right. And, and I very much thought that was going to be my last pro model because I thought that in my head, my style of skating was out of fashion. I was old, it considered, I was, I was considered old for being a pro skater. And so it was like, all right, I'm out. 
My, my ship is sank, <laughs> and, and this is my graphic representing that. Um, little did I know, two years later, there was more demand for my skateboard, and we'd have to bring it back out, and <laughs> I would still be out in the spotlight doing it. How many skateboards do you think that there's been like at this? Are you ever going to retire? Please, please say no. Uh -uh. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever. I, I imagine that if I'm able to, to stand on my own two feet, I'll still be able to ride a skateboard. If retirement is a, is a kind of a gray area with skateboarding because I stopped competing in 1999. I was far from retired. I've never quit. But people think that's retirement because you're not competing. Right. So people have different definitions of retirement. I would say that if I feel like my skills are slowing down and I'm not living up to the, the status of pro skateboarder, I won't do it in public. Is that retired? I don't know, but do you know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would be doing it in private. I'll be probably doing it as long as I can stand up, but I won't be putting out video parts. I won't be doing public exhibitions. I won't be doing, you know, interviews and stuff like that. Right. Um, just because I wouldn't feel, I, I, I wouldn't feel like my uh, justified in doing it. I don't want to just rest on my previous accolades. I want to, I want to walk the walk. And if I can't walk the walk and truly be relevant, then I'll just, I'll just sort of bow out of the spotlight. And I don't know what any of that means for retirement. Um, I would love to be not so busy. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that is coming. What would you do if you weren't skateboarding? Um, I was always pretty good with computers and a, an early adopter of new technology. So I would probably be doing something with computers or video editing or, or um, cameras or even social media. I mean, I feel like I embrace that kind of stuff usually a lot sooner than, than most people. So I got a head start and I was able to figure out like, computer video editing before that was really a thing. Right, because you were saying earlier that, that you did that when... I did that, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it paid the bills for a little bit. <laughs> if you could go back in time, what advice would you give your 13-year-old self? Uh, I would tell him, do not attempt to do a loop-de-loop -loop ramp in a gorilla suit. Because that's the day I broke my pelvis shooting an episode of Wild Boys, and that's the exact scenario. So that's pretty much all I'd tell him. And so if I found myself, fast forward to 20 years later, looking down a full loop ramp with a gorilla suit on, I would be able to remember that I gave myself that advice and maybe not do it. Or at least put a helmet on. The fact that you've even been on a skateboard in a gorilla suit is, is <laughs> so funny. <laughs> it was embarrassing, though, mostly because... Not because of the gorilla suit, believe it or not, but because the loop ramp had become something that I was well known for and had done an entire tour leading up to that day. Like we, we did, we, have, we actually have a loop ramp here in this office and I did it every night during the arena shows, 30 shows. And then we went a week later to shoot this episode of Wild Boys and it was all a big joke. We're in the gorilla suits, and it was like, let's do a loop. And then that's the day that I missed the loop. Oh. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> and uh, breaking your pelvis is rough. Well, I mean, breaking anything really Breaking anything is rough, but you're, what you come to realize is your pelvis is, is the central to your body, the central bone, really. And you can't walk. You can't sneeze going to the bathroom is painful <laughs> uh anything that that requires you to do a sudden movement shocks your whole body uh, and kind of freezes it up so uh that yeah. was really hard it was hard to get it was hard to heal and it was hard to get my confidence back skating i would say it took me about a year to really get back to what i was doing before i can see why if the way that you explain breaking your pelvis yeah, is it's, it's it's terrible uh Okay, you have some really hilarious stories about going through customs. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell me your favorite story that you have. Uh, I think probably the, the, the best example of that is, is that, um, well, it's funny. So 
a lot of people know my name, but they don't know my face, especially my face as a 50-year-old man. So they think I'm stuck in this time warp of being 20 to 30. <clears throat> and because they played, say they played my video game 20 years ago, they think that somehow I have been stuck in a time capsule ever since. Um, and also my real name is Anthony. No one ever called me Anthony through my life, but it's on all my ID. And, you know, you go to the doctor, or first day of school, Anthony Hawk. And so I was, I was going through um, security at an airport, and this woman saw my ID, and she said, Anthony Hawk. Oh, that's like, like that uh, Hawk, like the skateboarder, Tony Hawk. And I said, exactly, thinking she might pick up on that I said exactly, and I meant that. It's exactly me. Yeah. And she's like, oh, that's crazy. I wonder what he's up to these days. And I, I looked at her, I said, this. And she just gave me this puzzled look and waved me through. And that happens more often than I could even explain. Like that kind of stuff happens to me a lot. And I think it's funny. And sometimes I share it on social media. A lot of times I don't share it on social media because people think I'm just making these up. Well, I mean, you, could, you have a lot of crazy stories. I can see why some it's people would think that. It's always kind of in that mode, though, where it's like, oh, you look like this guy. Or that's crazy. You have the same name. <laughs> One time a guy, I was at, um, this one was hard to explain, like in a tweet, so I, I guess it'd be better to explain in person, but there was a guy that was sitting across from me at a gate, and he kept looking at me and looking at me, he said, you look just like that guy Tony Hawk, and I was like, I've heard that. He's like, oh, that's funny. And then this guy came up and got an autograph and a picture with me. Another guy came up and got an autograph with a picture with me and walked away, and the guy that was across from me was still looking at me like, <laughs> that guy thinks you're him. <laughs> oh my God. And like, we, like he and I shared some inside joke that it's not me. And I just let him run. It was funny. The fact that he saw somebody else get an autograph, though, and he thought they were wrong is just... It's, oh, it's great. It's, no, I mean, that's... Yeah. I guess that's, that's wow. the, and if people somehow think, like, I'm complaining, I just think it's funny. I don't care if... I really don't care if people recognize me or not. And I think it's funny that sometimes they, they think it's me and they'll want proof. And I'm like, I don't have to prove it to you. I don't, you can think I'm someone else. It's okay with me. <laughs> that's, that's an interesting way of going about now Show things. me your ID. Why? <laughs> For who? <laughs> show me your ID. <laughs> Just carry you around a skateboard all the time. Well, I do care. Okay, so some people think I carry on my skateboard because I'm try I want to draw attention to who I am. I carry on my skateboard in airports because if I check it in, it, it will go missing more times than I care to say. <laughs> and if it, if my skateboard or, or or it'll arrive late, if my skateboard arrives late and I'm going to an event, it's a big problem. That, so yeah. I always carry it on. So that's why it, people think that somehow I carry it on because I'm trying to check me out. This is me. It's like, no, I'm carrying it on because if it, I can do without my luggage, I can't do without my skateboard. Yeah, I guess I can see that. I mean, <laughs> generally, I think uh, clothing and, and uh, bathroom supplies would be a little bit more important but to, for, than a skateboard. Yeah, but usually I'm traveling to an event and to skate in public. Yeah. So, I need my skateboard. Yeah. I can borrow clothes. I can't borrow a skateboard. <laughs> well, I mean, you could. It just wouldn't be as comfortable. It would not work as well. I would be... I would look like... It would feel like a bad dream. Let's put it that way. It's like wearing the wrong pair of shoes. It's just not... On a much bigger public level, yes. <laughs> if you're a professional shoe model, <laughs> then... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay, you got me there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So let's pretend I want to be a pro skater. Let's go uh, show me something. I mean, I've got a bad foot, but you, I've, also a great start. I've also got you insurance, be a pro skater. so we're good. You gotta endure your first injury. Alrighty. I haven't seen your skill level, but... Um, it's, it's a one. Whatever the very lowest is. Are you, are you goofy footed or regular footed? Do you know? I, well, I can have my left foot at the front, so... Your I left foot's at the front, your regular yeah. foot. Okay. Good. Okay, that's probably better for your um, for your boot. Yeah, because then all the pressure of my body is yes. on my yeah. bad foot. So, um, 
Okay, well, uh, let's see. Let me see, stand on it so I can get a little better idea of what, what we're dealing with here. Oh! Okay, there you go. So, if you put this foot, <laughs> there, yeah, like right there. <laughs> that, that's pretty much the stance of being ready for almost anything, right? Almost so if you were So, if you were to push, you would want to get your foot back to this position. Right. Right, and more like straight, so like that. There you go. So that's pretty much like a position for a ramp, right there. Um, if you were gonna do an ollie or something, then you would move this foot to the very tip of the tail, like that. Okay. Can you ollie? No, I can't. Okay. I've, I've tried so many times, Yeah. but I actually can't. It's all just timing, it's more, I'll show you. It just requires, like I don't think anyone's a natural at ollies in the beginning. It's just a timing thing, and it's 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 a matter of pushing down on your back foot until until the tail hits the ground, but putting just enough weight on it so it's it's right at that moment that the tail snaps. You slide your front foot forward, and so it's like the board is is like this, and at the same moment you slide your front foot forward, and that levels it out and brings it up in the air. Right, so go. That's it. It's it's a simple move, and it's all timing. Um, and so, and that is the move that we use to get in the air, like, off of ramps, over stairs, um, and, and that is the foundation to almost every other modern trick. So any trick you see, even, even the grinds, some of the grinds and stuff, anything we do in the air, when you flip your board, the first thing you're doing is ollieing, and then you're doing the trick. Oh. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would try to help you. Yeah. There's something more complicated, but I worry that you've already broken your foot. Yeah. <laughs> Not skating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, this was a worry when I was little, but I guess you don't really need a skateboard to break your foot, apparently. No, I get, I get her doing the dumbest stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Hawk. So now that my foot isn't broken, I took Tony's advice and I learned how to do an ollie. You should always wear a helmet. I just, mine doesn't fit right now and I'm waiting to get a new one. But I did practice it on the grass until I got it down. So here we go. There we go.